for as much as I want it to be different, classical music is dead in the water. It still has some staying power in our collective memory, but good luck finding anyone who does this for a living. This mostly rings true for video games, with electro swing, chiptune, and rock to pump up its players. And yet, to this medium, I must ask, is classical dead? Yoko Shimamura was born on October 19, 1967, in Japan's Hyogo Prefecture. Growing up, she started taking piano lessons. With this, she would often pretend to compose with random little notes, until she could compose and perform her very first piece. Due to this, Yoko was influenced by the classical greats, Chopin, Beethoven, and Maurice Ravel, with their various ballads inspiring her to play the piano to the best of her ability. This specialty would carry through to her college years, as she was on the path to becoming a piano major at the Osaka College of Music. Her talent would have led her to be a piano teacher, but Yoko had become an avid gamer, and during college, a Capcom executive was advertising positions for students. So, with her minimal composing experience, she sent her samples, took an entrance exam, and got an audition lined up with the company. This career path seemed fairly risky. Because video games were just sprouting, their musical sound was rudimentary, not garnering much respect from the music world or Shimamura's family. Despite this, some of the melodies truly spoke to her, so she took the audition. Instead of teaching the ivory keys, Yoko went into the world of sound chips, in hope of bringing her musical passion into the gaming industry. After joining, she struggled to compose, and would go home feeling like she didn't belong. She'd only had composition as a single class in her college years. Despite Yoko's initial tears and frustration, she mustered what she could, and pressed on. Shimamura's first works were for arcade games, but these roles gave her a good starting place, with Samurai Sword and Arrangement for F1 Dream. After a few more scores, she was given a choice of what arcade game to cover next. Yoko ended up choosing Street Fighter 2, and the rest is history. When looking through the characters and their respective stages, she noticed that each character came from a different background, and suggested making music based on each of their backgrounds. Not only that, because of their stereotypical nature, she opted to compose more comical themes for the characters. This was the groundwork that led to Street Fighter's characters being easily identifiable, with hooks that still had their influence on the series to this day. Shimamura's simple, catchy tunes brought a rich flavor to an already diverse world. She tackled many regions, from America, China, Japan, and even India, all with the stereotypical nature to make the characters all the more easily identifiable through the music. Street Fighter 2 is one of the most iconic fighting games, and there's no point in underselling the melodies that aided its success. Not only did Yoko compose most tracks, she was also the chief sound person, in charge of recording sound effects and voice lines. This was her big breakthrough in the company, and to the gaming audience at large. But this wasn't where she belonged. Her background and inspiration were reflected in fantasy epics, such as Dragon Quest and Capcom's action game market didn't align with her aspirations. She got a taste for that at Capcom, by composing a song for Breath of Fire, before jumping ship to join Square. Moving into Square, video games' sound capabilities were slowly going in the right direction, with less compression and more freedom for instruments over bits. Square was known for their fantasy epics, so this was ideal for Yoko. Starting with the Super Nintendo, Shimamura would work on Live Alive, an RPG with seven different characters with their own unique stories that eventually lead to every narrative coming together in the end. Because of the game's inherent diversity, she was once again tasked with accompanying different narratives in their respective worlds, 
with an underlying sound that brings all of the disjointed pieces together. With this came catchy tunes, with a variety of musical instruments to score each different chapter, coupled with an obligatory show-stopping finale, capitalizing on our influences. This was a decent compromise for the time, and after collaborating with other composers for Front Mission, she was given a chance to give her own spin on a gaming great. Koji Kondo's work was already something that inspired Yoko on her path, but for her to continue the legacy in an RPG, which was Mario's first, mind you, was no simple matter. And the result was whimsical, dragging the players into an upbeat wonderland, elevating the fun of Mario's identity into a sense of bliss. This take on the IP still feels right at home, but there are songs of grandeur to sell the dramatic moments inherent within the story. This soundtrack is still loved to this day, and yet, it was the final composition for Shimamura in the 16-bit era. As Square went to join Sony, moving towards games on discs, rather than Nintendo's stubbornness with cartridges, the possibilities for sound expanded further. After getting a little credit for a fighting game, Yoko is tasked with scoring the entirety of another RPG. Parasite Eve, a survival horror RPG, lent itself to piano, strings, and other instruments to add to the game's unsettling nature. Not only that, but certain tracks brought in opera, further making this one of the most unfiltered doses of Yoko yet. Of course, the soundtrack wasn't only limited to this, there had to be battle themes, but Shimamura created a haunting beauty that serves as one of the peaks of her time with Square. And finally, after all of her compositions, her dreams and aspirations finally came true, as she was given a fantasy epic of her own with The Legend of Mana. To this day, this is the best showcase of Shimomura's passion, and her grandeur is not to be understated. These sweeping, comfortable songs, only to then whisk the player off on this magical journey, it's what Yoko was meant to do. This symphonic bliss that makes every moment come alive is a perfect hallmark for the end of her 90s composition. This proved that she belonged with Square, and there were many more opportunities waiting in the new millennium. So, it's a new millennium, and crossovers have become a novelty in the gaming industry. Disney, being the media conglomerate they are, wanted to up their video game production with Disney Interactive, and consulted Square, who shared the same office building. Square put their own spin on the idea, leading to one of the most unique dual crossovers in gaming history. With grandiose adventures and Disney nostalgia, Yoko was the woman for the job. When playing the beginning portion of Destiny Island, she was taken aback by the sea imagery, so she went to her instrument of choice and started crafting a melody. Translating this was limited with hardware limitations, as she had to use tone generators, but with enough persistence, Julie Beloved was made into one of the most blissful title screens and her favorite composition she's ever produced. It starts off the adventure with a calming, reassuring beauty with the waves of the island coming and going, only to then take its players through a monumental, warm adventure. Shimamura gave the beginning and Disney worlds their tension, but also a playfulness that evoked the same memories Disney's always had, while giving the adventure her signature classical splendor. All of this built up to a symphonic finale, bringing the adventure to a wonderful close. This game's emotional core, tied with its music, has transformed the experience into one of the most iconic and nostalgic RPGs for many. Through trial and error, Yoko brought her passion and influence into a new decade for the work to stand the test of time. This was her final body of work under Square, leaving a definitive catalog that led her into good standing with the industry at large. During the development of Kingdom Hearts, Yoko became pregnant and took maternity leave from Square Enix. With her good reputation garnered from Capcom and Square, she decided to become a freelancer, and her first stop on this journey was rekindling with a familiar icon. So, uh, what Mario and Luigi games were a part of your childhood? For me, I would say Mario and Luigi Bowser's Inside Story for the Nintendo DS. Um, it was a huge part of my childhood growing up, and when I had a DS, it was probably my, one of my favorite games to play. And uh, regarding the music, how did that impact your experience? The music is something that I couldn't find in a lot of other games as a kid. 
and it really complemented the experience and it got me thinking about music and video games more and more. If you had to describe the soundtracks for the whole series in a word, what feeling or emotion would ring true to you? I would say passionate. There's a lot of care and a lot of time that take time that's taken to create this music that um, that Yoko achieved, and the sound that resonated from this game was amazing. It just complemented the environments and it complemented every single thing. Even even there's there's a track called literally just called Danger, aptly named Danger, and it's whenever something important is about to happen. And that sound like rings in my head whenever um, I think something's about to happen. And whenever it plays throughout the game, I get chills down my spine. From these experiences, was your interest peaked in her other work? Yes, actually. In uh, a, a couple of years after I got um, done with Bowser's Inside Story, I tried looking for more games that she's made, like Legend of the Seven Stars back in on the uh, Super Nintendo Entertainment System, this SNES, and um, there's Partners in Time, which was more of a recent release back in 2004, and it was a game that not a lot of people talked about, but I wanted to play it just to experience that soundtrack, like I'm basically reading a new book from the same author. That's a good way to put it, actually. <laughs> um, what is your favorite track she ever composed for the series? I would say the final boss fight from Mario and Luigi Bowser's Inside Story in the final. It has a lot of power in the chords. It has a great synth track with a lot of with a lot of orchestral kind of uh, influences, and it really complements that final battle, that one last that one last go. How you know that it will it will end differently. It, how you know your journey is coming to an end more like. Sounds like a great part uh, to your childhood. Thank you so much for talking today. No worries. Despite her new position in freelancing, Yoko stayed close in relation to IPs she worked on before. She's still a mainstay for the Kingdom Hearts series, and kept working on the Mario and Luigi series out of joy, until the series came to a close. During this decade, she was also invited to gaming's biggest crossover. Shimamura was offered to arrange a few classic tracks in various styles for Super Smash Bros. Brawl, from electronic to straight-up classical, thanks to freelancing. Without expectation, she was able to freely explore new genres of music to fit whatever project she desired, while still getting the recognition she deserved due to her already established commitments, even if she's regarded for catchiness and classical alone. Besides Brawl, she was picked up to collaborate on the start of another big RPG, Xenoblade Chronicles, and there was nowhere her presence was felt more than the title screen. Another simply beautiful screen, with the music sweeping up its new players, letting them get a taste of the game with nothing more than a field, a day-night cycle, and an orchestra. Shimamura mainly covered the opening of the game, with epic tracks that truly sold the massive world the player was about to explore, along with the hometown, all in a beautifully classical flair. This was a work that influenced me the most. It's what blew my mind, and also made me feel right at home. This music helped set a precedent for the heights video game music could be to me. And while other tracks certainly took the cake, that's not to say Yoko's contributions to the series were weak. Far from it. I've loved classical music since childhood, and to see it meld with the medium I grew to love over the years was nothing short of magic. Her influence on the game and series is fleeting, but she still left an impact for more adventures to come. After kicking off the 2010s with Xenoblade, Yoko still had a plethora of opportunities. She'd be given other RPGs to work on, along with the Mario and Luigi series, Smash arrangements, and the various spin-offs for Kingdom Hearts, catching the eye of Square Enix. Of all the various RPG series they'd ask her to work on, they decided to go with Final Fantasy, their highest regarded IP, with its established worldwide critical acclaim. Nobu Oamatsu had left such an impression on the series, but according to Square, Yoko can live up to that. This project didn't even start in the 2010s, it started in 2005, 
and yet they still had Shimamura along for the ride. Their ambition was matched with an immaculate symphony that has no concern with previous compression or hardware limitations. A lot of the project broke through past limits that defined what Final Fantasy should be. Rather than a linear RPG with hallways, the player was allowed to explore to their heart's content. This remained true for Yoko, as she infused her classical music love in what feels like a love letter to music and the legacy of Final Fantasy. She brought together the fantasy classic, but with modern flares to bring about the dichotomy inherent from the series' identity. Yoko Shimamura was given the keys, and drove to the furthest reaches possible, making this game beloved to many due to the ambition being in the right hands all along. Her final major contribution to this decade was a long time coming. Even though you could be technical about the series, it had been 13 years since Kingdom Hearts 2, and it was up to Yoko to end the saga she started, seeing the characters to their logical end of this arc. Nothing says progress and tonality, like the evolution of Dearly Beloved, or Destati, or The Afternoon Streets, to name a few. These melodies were given their definitive end in the saga, revisiting what made up the series and how it's progressed since 2002. These melodies are given back in full force, adding a sense of powerful weight to the conclusion of Kingdom Hearts as we knew it. She respected the various Disney properties, while also injecting them with fresh nuances that made their inclusions worthwhile, even if the story's treatment could have been better. This was the Kingdom Hearts symphonic experience we could only dream of before, or not dream of if we were still fooled by Yoko's technical wizardry. This adventure was grand, sentimental, and still fun, which is what Kingdom Hearts is known for. This isn't the last of her involvement with the series, but who else but Yoko could create such a rip-roaring finale? Honestly, it's almost a crime not to acknowledge these accomplishments. So, they weren't. By the time Super Smash Bros. Ultimate came out, Yoko was invited and was continually invited to arrange tracks for the base game, with nearly every DLC pack having a guarantee of her arrangements. Who else but Shimamura could bring catchy iconic tunes that never get old, add more whimsy to Mario, or bring classical grandiosity to landmark video games? It's rare to see one's passions mixed together so well in this world, due to how much of a gamble it is. If she wanted to, she could have stuck with what she knew, becoming a piano teacher. But if she did, this whole legacy would have never happened. She followed her heart, and grew through trial and error into one of the most iconic composers in her industry. In some ways, she got lucky, and in other ways, she may have been meant to do this, if fate exists. Whenever I want to legitimately defend video game music, her classical influence easily makes her a good first choice. To think that she didn't feel she belonged to where she is now is a testament to who she's become. So, if her work is simply catchy tunes with classical influences, hey, how about both?